right. Thanks for having me, everyone. It was really nice to be asked to come speak to you all today. Um, fellow bird lovers. Um, I'm Kelsey Holloway. I work for Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. And I was asked to be here because I wrote a blog for Bird Conservancy a while back on the benefits of birds or the benefits of beavers um, on habitats and birds in general. So, um, and that began with just um, me being a fanatic about beavers after learning about them for a while. And so my goal here tonight is to hopefully uh, teach you guys a little bit about beavers and their benefits and maybe get you all interested in them as much as I am too, and create some beaver fanatics as well. So start off. working. All right, so Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, if you don't know this already, is a nonprofit that works to conserve birds in their habitats through three main teams. Uh, our first team is our science team, which works to gather a lot of data, uh, going over the trends of birds, all the way from Canada they're in their breeding grounds, through their migratory grounds, like here in Colorado, down into Mexico in the wintering grounds. Um, we have lots of long-term data sets, which is really great. Uh, you guys might know about this already, but uh, we also have our education team, which is focused out of Brighton, right on Bar Lake. And they work really hard and are really great at educating folks about the benefits of birds on our landscapes and why we need to keep healthy landscapes and love the outdoors. Hey, Kelsey. Can yeah. I interrupt real quick? I got a request for you to use the microphone if possible. Can you hear me? Is this better if I stand closer? A little bit better and then I'll wait for the for Paul. Uh, feel free to chat if that's a little bit better for you. He's the one who chatted it. Okay. We aren't sure if the microphone will have much influence on um, the video. Okay, he said it's better. Thank you. Sounds good. All right, um, and I work on our third team, which are, is our stewardship team. And we work to combine science and education to educate people on the land, like farmers and ranchers and other private landowners to um, put conservation actions on their properties to uh, help birds and conduct habitat projects. So. Uh, we get the benefit of educating others while using our science. So a little bit of background on me and why is a uh, biologist working on bird habitat so interested in beavers? Uh, how do they go together? But we'll just start from my basics. I grew up in Idaho and I had a love for the outdoors uh, ever since I was a kid hiking, camping, swimming, rafting, uh, were always I grew up. And I wanted to find a career where I could benefit the, the outdoors in a similar way that they had benefited me. So I ended up going to the U University of Idaho to study natural resources, and I got a degree in wildlife resources. And I learned a lot about management and everything that goes into making a diverse ecosystem and all about our keystone species and umbrella species um, and the different habitat types out there. Uh, and it really interested me. And after I graduated, I ended up getting a job in Northwestern Minnesota where I worked on wetland habitats. Um, I helped private landowners restore their wetlands through the wetland reserve program for uh, which is run through the natural resources conservation service which is a department or an agency out of the USDA uh, so it i really began my love for wetlands during this time um, but while i was there i realized how much i missed the west i loved our rocky mountains i loved the way of life out here uh, all the activities 
So as soon as Bird Conservancy of the Rockies flew a position for a private lands wildlife biologist, which specialized in uh, wetlands and riparian areas, I applied and I thought I'd be a perfect fit and apparently Bird Conservancy did too. And I've been here for five and a half years. So it has been an amazing position and I've been able to get to know a lot of landowners out east and learn a lot about Colorado's wetlands and riparian areas. Um, so further down the road, um, how did I get interested in beavers? Well, it all started with this one property that I work on. Um, this landowner holds a conservation easement in Morgan County, Colorado. And it's right on the Bijou Creek, which is typically or historically a very dry creek um, and just floods every once in a while when there's big rain events. And um, he was really interested in looking into ways to benefit wildlife even farther. He um, already had a phenomenal property. Uh, he used it for hunting every now and then, but mostly it was just this wildlife sanctuary. So one of the ideas he was looking into was putting in some uh, little dams across the creek to help pond some more water and expand the wetland acres out there. And so he put together this project in partnership with Ducks Unlimited, another organization. And we submitted it to uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service uh, who holds the easement for approval. And they got rejected. Uh, the NRCS uh, would hold a lot of liability on the property and they thought that putting a dam across a creek, despite how little water there actually was in the creek, uh, might pose a risk to anything downstream. So we put the project to the side, but luckily for us, within a year, beavers showed up. And what do you know, they ended up putting dams in the, almost the exact same places that we were planning on building dams in this creek. And they did a way better job than we would have ever done anyways. Um, they used all their resources. They, uh, their first dam is phenomenal. It's huge. And um, that bottom picture B uh, is what that first ponded area looks like. And that's where they built their lodge, which is that big pile of uh, sticks and grass in the middle. Um, and that top picture A is uh, one of the dams that they've built since then upstream. And it's in this picture, it was about four feet tall, but it's probably larger now. And since they did this, which was probably four years ago, they've expanded their territory and the wetlands down there cover so much of the bottom lands. So it was pretty exciting. And the landowner ended up um, getting so excited. He actually bought me this book, which I'm going to refer to a lot during this presentation. It's called Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. And um, I read it and just kind of fell in love with the creatures because of all the benefits they have to us in the landscape. So, um, and also picture C up there. Uh, after this project, I ended up, I work across 56 different properties along the South Platte. And I ended up noticing all the other beaver dams that were starting to be built. Um, this one was within the actual South Platte uh, River Channel, which was pretty cool to see. So um, just a little background on beavers. Uh, you might know about this already, but um, uh, North America was sculpted by beavers originally. Um, back before European settlers, uh, all that dark area would contain beavers and they would build dams in any water body that they could. Um, so think about any little stream or river that you could walk near today um, in Colorado or elsewhere. And uh, it might be a stream right now, but likely it was dammed and was a series of wetlands prior to settlement. So, but of course, settlement happened. We all know what happened after that. 
um, fur traders came in and saw the opportunity for trapping. There seemed to be um, a plentiful amount of fur bearing animals in North America. So they trapped away and by I believe 1840 uh, from Colorado to California, there weren't very many beavers left. So um, if you can picture all of those beaver dams in your mind that are no longer being maintained at this point, a lot of them got washed out. And then through settlement, people came in and removed a lot of the wetlands, drained them and channelized a lot of the rivers. So um, habitat just kind of disappeared. And sad story, yes, but we are seeing a rebound. So beavers, thankfully, are rodents that multiply really well. And because of uh, interest in their ability to construct wetlands and how we have all, uh, I guess, the United States has realized how important wetlands are to everything. Um, we've just seen a rebound. And um, this picture up here is, uh, you might not know the story, but uh, to relocate beavers in Idaho back in the day for reintroduction purposes, say there was a nuisance beaver damming where they didn't want it to, they would trap these beavers, live trap, and then they would parachute them into the back country of Idaho <laughs> to relocate them. Um, they don't do it anymore, but I just thought it was a wild story. Um, but a very innovative way of um, keeping beavers alive and keeping them on the landscape. Um, apparently there was only, I wanna say I read, there was only one uh, fatality while they were doing this. So um, pretty impressive, but um, the numbers show, uh, historically it was probably estimated that there were 60 to 400 million beavers on, in North America, which is wild. Um, and today we have around probably 15 million beavers. Um, and so we have a lot less today, but their numbers are not um, hurting. They're not going to go extinct anytime soon. So there's not a concern there, um, but we could use more. So what are some of the benefits of beavers? Uh, oh, why do we care? Uh, why are they important on our landscape? And Ben Goldfarb, who wrote this book, also said in there, described them as hydrological Swiss army knives. And I thought that was a really good example of what they do um, uh, because they really do a lot for us. And I'll explain a lot of the reasons why. First off, Colorado, we have seen a lot of issues with wildfire, um, especially in the recent years. They're more destructive, um, they're larger, and uh, beavers can actually help us with wildfire mitigation. This diagram here was created by Dr. Emily Fairfax, and she is a researcher who's been studying beavers and their dams and their effects on the landscape. And uh, this shows, if you look at that first poem titled Stream Without Beavers, uh, you can see where the groundwater level is pretty narrow right there and kind of just sticks within that stream channel. So all the vegetation surrounding the little riparian area, we'll call it, only receives, uh, only gets its irrigation from precipitation. So think about when we get most of our precipitation. It's in the spring, right? And come summertime, or that one titled drought conditions, uh, we aren't getting a lot more rain. So those plants aren't being irrigated. And only the stuff right within the channel is being able to grab water from that groundwater table. And come late summertime, it's fire season, so fires take off and all that vegetation burns. It's just uh, fuel. But you get a stream with beavers and uh, they dam up the water and it spreads out the water along the surface and irrigates all of that plant life 
for later into the season, it holds the water back. But what it's doing on the surface isn't quite as amazing as what it does below ground. So that groundwater table ends up rising and spreading. So all of that vegetation is also able to access water later into the season, keeping it green, keeping it moist and uh, more resistant to fire. So later in the season, when the fires spring up, um, all these areas uh, remain green because they still have water content within them. Um, so uh, it, imagine some of our creeks and some of our wetlands uh, with more beaver dams, more expanded wet areas. We could really uh, reduce some of the damage that wildfires have uh, within those areas. Um, some other benefits of these beaver dams during wildfires is their ability to um, uh, hold sediment back. So after a wildfire, uh, we get a lot of runoff from rains or snow and um, these buffer zones created by this riparian vegetation traps the sediment so it doesn't get into our uh, water system. Uh, also the beaver dams themselves help stop some of this sediment as well. So lots of positives. Uh, this is another uh, photo from uh, Emily Fairfax's uh, presentations and papers but it shows the effects of beaver dams just visually. And you can see in that top photo, the stream over to the right didn't have any beaver dams in it. And there is no vegetation in sight um, where the stream to the left that had beaver dams kept vegetation and even kept green vegetation and still has water in it as well. So. Uh, the beaver dams definitely helped uh, retain some moisture there and some vegetation. And think about these pictures too. If there is a wildfire on the landscape, where are all the wildlife going to run to? These are also refuge areas for mammals, birds, reptiles, um, all of the above. So very important areas. Um, the same kind of thing can be said about drought and climate change. So uh, you see these drying effects, but these beaver dams can do the same thing where they store water in the ground longer and release that water at a slower rate. So the vegetation can hold on to the water um, and we have uh, more resistant to drought. Uh, there was a study which went along with this graph that showed that um, three years of drought and the riparian areas with beaver dams uh, retain moisture and green vegetation throughout the three years. So um, it's a, a good fact to share with people when they're uh, worried about damming across their creeks. So another positive for um, keeping beavers on the landscape is stream restoration. Um, we all look at, at there are a bunch of professional organizations that work on stream restoration. It costs tons of money. It takes lots of planning and time. Um, and again, beavers could do it uh, for free. So um, this was a good little uh, diagram that I found online, but it shows how uh, channels are a lot of the time very channelized. Uh, you get steep banks and rivers are typically disconnected from their floodplains. Uh, historically, our rivers would have been way more connected with our floodplains um, and not been so deep and narrow. So if you get a beaver uh, building a dam within those channels, it ends up storing a lot of sediment behind the dam and slowing the water down and raising water tables. And that kind of elevates uh, the base of that creek and widens it. So it slows the water down and raises everything. You also see increased vegetation growth within there as well. Um, lots of wetland vegetation, woody vegetation. Um, and the water eventually tries to find its way around the beaver dam. That's just what water does. So it trickles through, it goes to the side. And while it's doing that, it's increasing its sinuosity or the way it curves. So 
uh, we start to see it creates a, kind of a brand new blood play where it can turn and it can spread out and reconnect. Um, sometimes also beaver dams will blow out and that too uh, increases uh, the diversity in what the channel is doing. It creates some uh, deep pond areas, some wetland areas, and like in uh, figure D, uh, it can create some braiding. So again, over time, uh, the beavers will just continue to dam. That's just what they do. They're gonna keep trying over and over again. And eventually you see the level of that creek raising so it starts to reconnect with that original floodplain. This takes a long time, so it's not a quick process, but um, beavers can do it and they work with nature to do it. And the final product is that diagram F right there where you have a network of channels of wetlands, diverse vegetation and habitat for all the species that we really care about. Um, and if humans were to do that, we try to do it all at once and it would be costly <laughs> and might fail terribly. Uh, and one of my favorite reasons for uh, promoting beavers is just the habitat influence they have. It's pretty phenomenal that you all have probably been out and seen wetlands and the diversity around these wetlands. Um, for birds specifically, uh, they're great stopover locations uh, along the South Platte where I work. It's a really big migratory bird stopover location for waterfowl, shorebirds, um, and lots of other breeding birds coming through. Um, but a lot of the time uh, we hear that people are really concerned about fish species and dams. Um, if these beavers put dams within these creeks and rivers, how are the fish gonna get through them to spawn or to get where they need to go? But there have actually been studies, which is pretty cool, that has shown that um, native fish have evolved with beavers and their dams. So they're able to find their way through the dam, around the dam, over the dam, whatever they need to do. Um, and these dams end up providing uh, protection from non-native fish. There's uh, more little niches within the ponds behind them for them to forage and find protection and to spawn. Uh, so beaver dams provide them great habitat. Uh, there was even a study done by Bows et al. in 2016, where they um, constructed, or naturally they were constructed, 240 dams in this area that had a threatened population of steelhead. And since those dams were put in, they have seen 168% increase in abundance of these fish. There's been a 52% increase in survival of these fish. And there's been 172% production increase in these fish. So if that is not reason enough for <laughs> promoting beaver dams and, to support our native fish species, I don't know what is. Um, and we all know uh, we see a lot of awesome mammals in these wetland areas too. It's just a very biodiverse uh, habitat area. About 80% of wildlife visit wetland and riparian areas at some point in their life cycle, whether it's for uh, breeding or their full life cycle or a migratory stopover point. Um, they're just very necessary to maintain our species. Um, another big point to make for uh, beavers is water storage. Uh, being in Colorado, we uh, hold a lot of the headwaters of, um, of Colorado, of the United States. We, our water goes all over the place. And um, uh, storage is really a concern, actually. Uh, the South Platte Basin Roundtable is working on figuring out ways where we can supply water for our increasing populations while maintaining our agriculture, while maintaining our environment our industries, um, trying to focus on everything. So um, a lot of discussion is had on how we store more water. And uh, because I love beavers, my first thought was, let's put more beavers on the landscape <laughs> because they store water. 
Um, so I was going to read a little excerpt from you from this book, um, just because he puts into words uh, really well sometimes what I'm thinking. So, uh, and he's done a lot of research. So uh, in 2005, David Butler and George Mallinson, geographers at Texas State University and the University of Iowa, calculated that somewhere between 15 and 250 million beaver ponds puddled North America before European arrival. Let's split the difference and estimate that the continent is laced with 150 million ponds that averaged a single acre apiece. If that's true, beavers once submerged 234,000 square miles in North America, an area larger than Nevada and Arizona put together. So think about that historically. Um, a couple very large states, just complete wetlands uh, and how much water storage that likely was. It's pretty impressive. And so I just encourage beaver damming just for water storage in general. Um, I also think it would be really beneficial to Colorado to encourage, especially in these high country areas. Uh, this is from State Forest State Park on a hike I went one time. Um, and these beavers dammed right up at the very top, as high as they could, um, and it was pretty cool. But uh, we're seeing an earlier spring runoff. Our snow melts faster, and it typically comes down in one big burst. But if we had the ability to slow some of that flow down through beaver dams, we could lengthen the amount of time we were able to access some of this water throughout the year. So. Uh, just another benefit uh, to having dams on the landscape. And I know probably all of us here uh, participate in some form of outdoor recreation and try to imagine um, or picture yourself in one of your favorite outdoor activities. Likely it deals with water or it's around water. Um, when I go on hikes, when I plan my hikes, I like going to Alpine Lakes. And so it, it's around water, whether you're rafting or fishing, um, chances are that okay, you deal with wetlands. Um, and so you either directly or indirectly are influenced by beaver dams or their potential habitat. So um, I'm just gonna throw out some numbers for you that uh, might be of interest, but I went to a conference one time and Business for Water presented that 6.7 million people uh, participate in water-related recreational activities in Colorado per year. That's $18.8 billion spent in Colorado and 131,000 jobs. So uh, lots of money and lots of what we do. So um, a lot of that either directly or indirectly is affected by wetlands within Colorado, um, whether it's water storage, whether it's a uh, place to hunt or beaver dams help clean our waters, uh, you're being affected by them. So with all of these amazing benefits, why are there so many challenges to keeping beavers expanding on our landscape? or um, why are people against beavers in the first place? And um, a lot of it has to do with just uh, people's perception. Uh, they get ideas in their mind and uh, it's really hard to change some, some minds out there. And um, one more little bit I wanna read out of this book, it says, we humans are fanatical, orderly micromanagers of the natural world. We like our crops planted in parallel furrows, our dams poured with smooth concrete, and our rivers straightjacketed and obedient. Beavers, meanwhile, create apparent chaos, jumbles of downed trees, riotous streamside vegetation, creeks that jump, jump their banks with abandon. What looks like disorder, though, is more properly described as complexity, a profusion of life-supporting habitats that benefit nearly everything that crawls, walks, flies, and swims in North America and Europe. A beaver pond is more than a body of water supporting the needs of a group of beavers, wrote James B. Trepathan in 1975. 
but the epicenter of a whole dynamic ecosystem. So humans naturally just want to keep things very orderly. They want to be able to understand everything. Um, and beavers are very go with the flow, um, do things the way they need to be done. So uh, changing those views and getting people to accept um, that not everything needs to be perfect is sometimes a challenge. Um, along with changing minds is just straight laws and permitting. Uh, a lot of, or some folks in Colorado are trying to replicate beaver dams on the landscape um, in like headwaters area to have those great effects. And uh, permitting is a really hard issue because if you dam any water, uh, do you have a water right for that? So uh, downstream users can see that as you keeping them from their water source. Um, and then sometimes uh, project goals don't align as well with what beavers are doing on the landscape. Uh, for example, I'm working on a wetland restoration and this wetland is supposed to, uh, it's a warm water slough. So it's supposed to keep some flow through it so that it remains open water into the winter when um, other bodies of water would normally freeze over these wetlands remain open warm water. And this is really good for our wintering bird species and other wildlife on the landscape. And, but these beavers have found these areas and they have started to dam these wetlands and they're doing exactly what they're supposed to, like slowing the water down and holding sediment back. Uh, but it's having an opposing effect to what we want in this wetland. So who's supposed to be the winner here. So sometimes it's just challenging to know what is right to do. And so um, I'm just gonna share some of the projects that um, I've been interested or working on uh, as I've seen these beavers expand their territory. Um, because I work with private landowners I really try to stay a step ahead of issues that they might see um, so that I can help them understand what's going on and how we can and come up with ideas how we can work on it together. Um, up in our uh, higher mountain areas, a lot of uh, organizations are working on what are called beaver dam analogs. And these are those um, they're mimicking beaver dams on the landscape. So if you have an area that's not retaining water very well, maybe it was historically a wetter meadow, but now it's dry, sagebrush is starting to fill in. Um, you can come in and put in these beaver dam analogs, which does the same thing as a beaver dam. It slows the water down, it spreads it out on the landscape and irrigates a lot more vegetation, which increases the biodiversity. And here's a little diagram of how those are built. Um, but they're very cool. And over time in some areas, you'll get woody vegetation filling back in around these beaver dam analogs. And it ends up attracting beavers to the area and then they continue the project themselves. So pretty cool ideas. They're more and more being constructed um, in higher areas. Uh, again, permitting is sometimes an issue, but I think they're becoming more favored too, uh, as people see their benefits. Um, I have yet to do one of these projects, but it's one I really want to do because they are so awesome. Um, fortunately for me, there are tons of beavers in the area where I work, so I don't need to mimic what they're doing. They do it very well themselves, sometimes too well. Um, so we have a lot of culvert structures or water control structures for um, around roads or for irrigation. And beavers see these little holes in the ground as um, basically holes in a dam and they need to stop the water from going through there. So they end up trying to dam these culverts. And I recently took a training from the Beaver Institute, which was a great training. It helped me learn to assess a site and uh, plan and build these structures which protect um, these culverts or uh, other 
areas that are being dammed that shouldn't be dammed. So that top picture is me creating a culvert fence um, that protects the inlet and I put one on the outlet too. And then the bottom one is a, called a beaver flow device. And uh, if you look over on the left-hand side of the picture, there's a, kind of a dam over there. And essentially it's putting a, uh, a pipe through the dam and it secretly allows water to go through the dam unbeknownst to the beaver. So the beaver keeps trying to dam its dam thinking, why is the water not being um, held back? Uh, but really it's coming from upstream uh, in that inlet. Um, and this really helps to be able to control water levels. So if they dam somewhere and they're flooding somewhere they shouldn't, this is a really good structure. And these allow us to keep beavers on the landscape but also mitigate some of their negative effects. So um, I like having these, uh, being able to build these as just tools in our toolbox, just in case. Um, here's a little diagram of the beaver flow device. It's, it's a pretty cool design. Another way I'm working with landowners uh, is tree loss mitigation. A lot of them um, have land along the South Platte River and they're seeing some of their cottonwoods just be decimated. And um, in my mind, I think we have a lot of cottonwoods, but I understand where they're coming from. Uh, they're just concerned about these trees they've grown up around. And it's, I think it's very sentimental to, to be around trees. So seeing something destroy trees so easily and fast is scary. So um, there's a sand paint method where you can mix sand and paint and paint it on the bark of the tree. And the beavers typically don't like to chew on that. Uh, and there is um, the fencing of the trees. You can do it individually or as a grove. And I even learned about a project, I'm not exactly sure where it was, but I heard it was in Colorado where folks went out and they wrapped all of their native trees in this wire and left the non-native trees alone. And the beavers came in and took out all the non-native trees. So it was a really good form of restoration on the landscape. Uh, and finally, one of the other big projects I'm working on is um, outreach, education and outreach. And that's in the form of presentations like this, or uh, I'm working on workshops. So. Over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be teaching landowners how to build those beaver flow devices and those protective fencing for their culverts. Uh, and um, I have been working with uh, an organization called the Platte Mason Time Lapse. And uh, they have this cool uh, way of doing outreach and education where they take time lapse video of the Platte River. Uh, I think a lot of it up in Nebraska, and uh, I think they said they had seven years of time-lapse photography of just watching this, the Platte River, and it's really awesome. I recommend going to their website and checking it out. It's great footage, um, but they were interested in putting cameras on the South Platte River as well and seeing what our time-lapse would look like down here. So we've been working together to identify a location for cameras, and we think we found one right on an area where a beaver repeatedly builds a dam year after year, despite it being blown out every single year by our floodwaters. Um, so that could be exciting footage to look for in the future and a unique way of sharing what they do on our landscape. And this picture right here is actually one of the aerial images from that basin time lapse. Uh, it's pretty cool. But uh, hopefully that gave you a little knowledge about beavers. I don't consider myself an expert. I'm more of just a fanatic and what they can do for, for our birds and other species um, and just our landscape in general. But I'm happy to answer questions. And if I can't answer them, I can hopefully refer you anywhere. Yeah? I'm not sure if you're is there just one species of beaver in North America? Uh, she asked if there's just one species of beaver in North America, and yes, there is. Uh, there's another species over in Europe. So, let's see. We have a question here. It looks like Paul, your hand is still up. Do you have a question? Feel free to unmute. Okay, it's okay if people unmute as well. 
either way, chat window or unmute. Okay, not seeing, I'm not sure if Paul is still with us, but in the meantime, um, we have a question from Jesse. Um, when do beavers breed and how many young do they typically have? Oh, um, I'm not sure on the timing, but I think they, uh, springtime, but they reproduce wildly. I think it's between uh, like, they can have four to nine kits, average of six, I believe. But within their one lodge, they have the male and the female, they can have their first litter. And then after a year, they'll have another litter, but then they keep that first litter in there as well. So they could have so many kids in their lodge and they're teaching them the entire time. And then after year two, they kick those other ones out and they just keep that cycle going. So uh, they're very good at reproducing. Okay. Um, I see uh, you know, the beaver before and they have uh, yellow orange teeth. Now, why is that? Yeah, the question was why do beavers have those yellow orange teeth? And luckily, I just read a little bit about this, so I might be able to answer this. <laughs> but um, it has to do with. Um, Their diet, I believe, creates that color, but uh, the they've got really hard teeth to be able to chew on the trees a lot. And I believe it's, sorry, what? The enamel, yeah. And I believe it's iron in their diet that makes them that yellow color. But um, I would definitely recommend if you are interested. <laughs> they do talk about it in the Eager book a lot. Thank you. Yeah, another one. So I. I see evidence frequently of dams that have been blown out. And I wonder about our annual high spring runoff. Does it happen all the time? Is it beautiful spring runoff? Spring runoff is probably supposed to happen if the things go back and forth. Yeah, she asked about um, the dam blowouts if it happens every year or if it's just periodically, but um, some dams do blow out every year. Uh, there was one beaver, uh, you can even look this up on uh, Google imagery near uh, Ovid. There was a dam that was put in, it was really extensive and beautiful and it's been washed out year after year. And it's, but they're persistent and they're just gonna keep trying and it keeps them busy. And, but some of them, they do maintain their structure. Most of the ones, if they're right, in uh, the channel of like the South Platte, it's gonna get blown out. But if they choose a side channel or a slower stream or creek, uh, they'll typically last for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the question was, uh, how many, or how often are there beavers out in Eastern Colorado? We don't really uh, think of them being out there, but yeah, it's any place where you're going to get some water and some good woody vegetation, like cottonwoods are some of their number one, uh, choices for dam building and for food along with willows and aspens and so the south Platte is prime habitat for them so they have been moving in and branching out and as they reproduce they'll just find more and more channels so it's pretty wild yeah. any more questions any in the chat one question um any info on what happened with beavers in the 2021 fire zones um, like the Cameron Peak Fire and the East Troublesome Creek? Um, sorry, can you repeat the question on that? Yeah, um, wondering, someone's wondering if there's any info on what happened with beavers in the 2021 um, fire zones. Um, I believe that's actually being looked into. I know um, Dr. Emily Fairfax, who I uh, spoke about earlier, uh, was actually talking on NPR recently about Colorado's 
um, wildfires and the beavers being um, being there as mitigation for those fires. So um, a lot of the times you just have a lag in what's being reported. So I think we might actually see some uh, research or something pop up more about their effects in those fires as well. Thank you. And one more question. Um, what do beavers do in the winter um, and when the body of water they have for their dam freezes? Uh, that's a really cool question. Um, beavers like to cut down a lot of vegetation and just throw it in their pond throughout the year. So a lot of the times in beaver ponds, you'll just see downed woody vegetation in there. And that is there. So when the pond does freeze up, they're able to come out of their lodge, which their exits are underwater from their lodge. And they're able to go and grab that woody vegetation that's below the ice. And their lodges are built so that they can go in and out below the water. But within their lodge, it remains a pretty toasty home. So they're able to just live in there while it's really cold all winter long. And they have really good fat stores too on their body. Uh, their tails, um, their paddles are actually really big fat storage. So they go through that in the winter as well. So um, they're really built for going through winter. So um, pretty efficient creatures. Yeah. Um, so Kelsey, I, uh, I often hear people out in the field, just casual people like us, um, saying they saw a beaver. And I mean, I think sometimes I hear that. Mm -hmm. So I must. So I was wondering if you could help us know how to figure out when we're seeing a beaver versus a muskrat. Um, I honestly even working with beavers, or the question was, how do I identify if you're actually seeing a beaver or if it's a muskrat, how to know if you've seen a beaver. And I will just throw out that I have actually never seen a beaver in person, as wild as it sounds. Okay. Yeah. The tails are very different than... I don't think so either. Um, but yeah, beaver tails have are really big paddle-like tails and beavers can get huge in size. Um, I think like a 70 pounds, like as big as a dog. So, um, but a lot of the time when you see a beaver swimming through the water, they say you see the head, but you, it's like a glacier or an iceberg where you don't see the rest of the body. So it could be very confusing. Um, but I've also heard a lot of the times they come out uh, later in the evening. A lot of the landowners I work with, they're like, they come out like clockwork, six o'clock in the evening, they come out and start working on their dam. So if it's midday, you likely aren't seeing a beaver, I'd say. Yeah. The more you see is the head, study uh, the photos, you can tell the difference from the ears. Okay. And the beavers have like a rounded ear, uh -huh. and the muskrats don't. Uh, okay. So, so it's, That's it's good a to know. Dead giveaway. Okay. And the beaver has a big one. Yeah. Um, it was pointed out to look at the ears if they're swimming. Uh, they're rounded on beavers, but not on muskrats. Correct? I say that correct. No. You have another question here as well. Um, do you know whether Colorado Parks and Wildlife are going to add beavers in the high country? Um, I think. I uh, think there are some reintroduction efforts going on. Um, I don't know if it's specific to Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, a lot of it uh, is, a lot of it is just relying on natural uh, progress of beavers moving into areas. And uh, I think it has to deal with water rights too. We're a really big state that focuses on water rights. So if you introduce a beaver into a system, they're going to store water. And even though it's not taking water from the system, um, downstream users might see it as that. So it gets a little political there. So um, I think uh, reintroducing beavers is more of a slow process than uh, 
we would like. Yep. a beaver deceiver beaver float device okay. they could use a beaver float device it sounds like yeah they do they do and on the other side you can see where they put the trees down they're they're there in fact yeah i saw a beaver this winter when i just couldn't believe the bar was so low it was in wood street just east and you can see the hut practically out of the water but on the side of the beaver Swimming around and doing all the fishermen fish uh -huh. and uh, they're there, they're waiting. Yeah, they're waiting. definitely. Um, it, comments were just made about the evidence of beavers being in the area along the Poudre River and the fact that uh, along the Poudre River there are sand painted trees as well, which is pretty cool. So, yeah. interesting, interesting aspect about the city painting the set the trees with sand. They paint the cottonwoods, but not the cracked willows. Oh, perfect. So the, the beavers take out the cracked willows. That's great. I, yeah, it's an invasive one. Yeah. Um, what would be the beaver's most dangerous predator? Uh, a beaver's most dangerous predator is um, probably humans at this point. But um, other than that, uh, out in the wild, it's going to be your big uh, species like your cougars, your wolves. Um, uh, this book talks a lot about the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone, but mm -hmm. also the reintroduction of beavers and how they're part of that whole restoration of that ecosystem and the wolves and the beavers working together. So mm -hmm. it's kind of cool, but yeah, big, big carnivores. <laughs> Yeah, um, the question is about beavers and like building the beaver dam analogs and um, versus reintroduction of beavers. And uh, one point I'll make is sometimes these areas have lacked uh, water for so long that they're not really good habitat for beavers. So you need some kind of woody component for them to be able to survive. So you get some of these historically wet meadows, which are just full of sagebrush. And you have to kind of begin the restoration for them. So that's when a beaver dam analog would be good to begin that wetland process. Um, but if a beaver comes in naturally, that's completely acceptable. Um, but it is up to the landowner to, uh, they can look into trapping um, or doing what they want with the beaver. Um, but it's, that's why, we're trying to promote some education. And uh, a lot of the times in those meadows, it's beneficial for like ranchers to 
have beavers there and help them store some more water. Uh, any more questions online? Not seeing any here. Thanks for your presentation. That was awesome. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, if you have more questions, please reach out, um, call, email. Um, if you know of any locations who could use those beaver uh, flow devices, I would. We have a grant, so we're ready to install a few. So. I have two quick announcements before everybody dashes off. Um, the first one is about next month's program. Um, on no, our next meeting is November 11th. And we're gonna hear from Risa Conray, who's with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. She'll be presenting about back, I'm sorry, bald eagles in our backyard, population trends, habitat use, and human impacts on Colorado's front range. And then just an advance notice, um, our meeting in December, we don't have a presentation. Um, we're going to be doing uh, some version of our traditional member slideshow. We're still working out the details of how to do that in this um, online or hybrid format. Um, but start looking through your photos now. Um, bird and wildlife photos in preparation for our December slideshow. We'll have more details in our next couple of newsletters. And we're encouraging people to look for photos related to these themes. One, uh, wildlife and birds in action. Uh, two, uh, critter photo captures. Or three, this scenery is a wow. Um, so more details to come. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we're still sorting out our technical details. This was smoother than last month, but we'll keep trying to make it better each time. And um, uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks for joining us.